Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. This session will be presented in English. Um, welcome to this member session on analysis and improvement. I'm stoked to see that there's uh, already 45 people joining us tonight. So that's pretty cool. Thank you for joining. Um, today, uh, we, are, we have three of our technical team members that are with us to uh, present this session on analysis and improvement. We'll do live analysis with some video clips. So we have uh, here, we have uh, Melon J from Big White. <laughs> And we yep. have Damo Janek from Whistler. We also have Breen Throat from Ottawa, Pakenham. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so uh, with, uh, first of all, we uh, will give you a bit of uh, context, like each of the, the team member will analyze a series of videos and they will give you a bit of a context for each of these videos and we'll go ahead with their analysis. That, is of course based on our CASI uh, technical writing skills, so the core competencies and the advanced competencies. Um, if you have, guys have any, if any one of you have any questions on uh, the analysis, uh, anything that you did not catch or did not understand, please make sure to raise your hand or write them in the chat. I'll be uh, monitoring the, the chat to make sure uh, everything gets answered. So we'll go ahead and get started with a bit of a reminder of our technical competencies that, that we use as filters for our analysis. So the core competencies, centered and mobile, turning with the lower body, balance along the working edge, and our advanced competencies, strength and flow, arc to arc, loading and deflection, and steering versatility. So we won't go too deep in these as we covered them in previous sessions and uh, the goal today is really to get some live analysis. You guys ready? Ooh, I'm sure I'm Ew. hearing the crowd. Ew. All right, so we'll get started with um, first uh, video with Melan. Melan, do you so, want to give a yeah, little just context? I'm going to do a little bit of context about what I'm going to launch into. I've got a series of four videos and uh, it's based around, I was asked to present on the level four standard. Um, and, uh, and, but I think one of the things that I'd like to link back to and the, my, my goal for this one is to look at the, some common movement patterns that happen and are really, really important to achieve a level four standard. But there are also movement patterns that we see in uh, low intermediate riders when we're out there teaching all the time. So I wanna look at the similarities between a movement pattern that is at standard, below standard on a level four candidate uh, or a series level four candidates, as well as uh, some video of some low intermediate riding that we can break apart, to look for those key similarities. Um, and so that's where I'm going tonight with my series of videos. So with that, let's take a look at uh, the level four evaluator here, riding along. And what we're gonna look at, oh, uh, the previous slide there, Jen, yeah, this one. What we're gonna look at in this rider is how they move into the turn. We're looking for, uh, the riding and we're looking for their ability that's showing up really chunky on my screen jen not particularly smooth how is it for you it looks good on my side awesome okay so what we're looking for in this rider as we watch it go a little bit slower is we're looking for their ability to move their mass or create some inclination early in the turn and then towards the end of the turn they're able to really angulate and the um and the result is that as they move through this movement pattern on their heel edge, first incline, moving to angulation, it allows them to be in a really centered and mobile position, getting around on the toe edge and being able to, to move through the toe edge turn really, really effectively. So let's take another look at this slow motion video. We can see the level four evaluator moving towards a really nice, angulated position with uh, lots of flex at the ankle, knee and hip and the mass pretty much over top of the snowboard and most of the edge angle being held with bending of the lower joints rather than leaning of the upper body. And the lean in the upper body happens above the fall line. 
allowing the rider to be in a really strong position in that toe edge turn, as we can see, to be able to deal with the sort of forces that we're dealing with when we're riding at level four speeds and at level four terrain. If we pop onto the next slide, let's take a look at a level four candidate as they're riding down the same exact terrain. So it's nice because we can take out a lot of those uh, environmental uh, factors and really look at the, the rider at the level four standard, as well as this level four candidate uh, riding the same exact terrain on the same exact day. They're right one right after the other. Well, let's take a look at this rider. And as they're riding their way through, you'll notice that, wow, they're a strong rider and they're able to handle this terrain. In their toe edge turns, they really get into uh, not the strongest of positions and really locks out their mobility on their, on their toe edge. So if we see the rider come around and onto their toe edge, while they deal with the terrain effectively, there's a big amount of loading that happens towards the end of the toe edge turn, particularly in this next one as we come around a series of sort of terrain traps and challenges. You can see the rider lose their position and get really twisted up. They make a really strong recovery move to get out of it, and so it's great. However, that position that they ended up in wasn't the strongest, and if the terrain was more challenging or the speeds were higher, they'd get themselves into a lot of trouble. And so I know we're gonna chat a little bit about some cause and effect ideas, but I, what I really wanna point out to you guys as we watch this rider is how they don't really move into an, angu or into an inclined position on the heel edge until they're well below the, the fall line. So towards the end of their turn. The mass doesn't really move inside until the fall line and this ends up with a big pressure spike, the feet go out, the board's on a really high edge angle. And the result is that into the next turn, they end up with uh, a body position that's neither, neither quite centered nor mobile uh, to be able to get through terrain and handle higher speeds. And this is something that we see really commonly. We wanna think about how we're gonna get our edge angle and it's really challenging to feel like like we need to lean into the turn, particularly committing to leaning into the turn and getting ourselves to incline first to get our early edge angle above the fall line. So if we look at this rider again, look at some of the turns, it, Jenny, if you can replay this video in loop or just one more time, really taking a look at how as a nice reference point for a rider, looking at the front arm and the front shoulder, you can see the shadows in the jacket and how that really doesn't move inside of the arc until at or below the fall line and stays in the inside of the arc for much too long. And there's not a lot of angulation happening. The mass stays uphill and inside. And this results in the rider having to make quite a large move. So they're tipping uphill inside the board loads, making the snow spray. And then they have to move their body into a, an awkward position to get themselves to go across that uh, onto the, the toe edge. And so to get the toe edge turn started, it's pretty awkward. And there's a loss of flow in, in the riding, a loss of flow from one arc to the next. And there's a stop point in between the heel edge to the toe edge turn and the rider loses their big strong position to be able to get into this. Hey, Hopefully Melvin. you guys can see what I'm seeing. Yeah. We have a question in the chat, like where, where is this mountain? Is it Silver This Star? is, uh, no, this is Sun Peaks Sun in, Pe um, uh, just outside of Kamloops in British Columbia, interior BC. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll just let this, this, um, video play through. Hopefully we can see that problem with timing and inclination and angulation and its result in our lack of loss of a centered and mobile position. And then we go on to the next slide. We're going to take a look for those same exact movement patterns in our intermediate riders. So low intermediate riders or low intermediate riding. This is, um, this is a Cassie candidate 
imitating the same exact problem. This Cassie Canada has been asked to incline a ton at the end of the turn and start their turns by using angulation. And the result is they actually get quite a bit of chatter on a relatively beautiful slope. And they end up in a really awkward position on their toe edge turns. If we take a look at this a little bit more slowly, the same cue that we were looking for, the shoulder not really moving inside the turn above the fall line, and then moving really drastically inside, there's that big inclination. There's the snowboard, the snow spray is coming down the hill. There's lots of loading happening at the end of the turn. And then they have to get themselves into a very awkward position as they move into their toe edge turn. It's not a lot of flow. And they end up with a toe edge turn that's not really as successful as it could have been. Let's take a look at the next, uh, the next set of turns. You'll see the same thing happen again, and even more so. Watch them as they move across, looking for that shoulder. It's the feet and the ankles that change edge first. Shoulders move across. There's not much inclination till the very end of the turn. And now all the inclination takes over. There's very little angulation. The ankles are really open. And they have to make a very awkward move onto their new edge. And watch what happens. They get into a really similar position as our level four candidate. They end up on the front foot with some twist uh, between the upper and the lower body. And if they were to hit a, a bump or a lump in that sort of terrain, they get themselves into some pretty deep trouble. There, can we see that below the fall line, there's so much inclination that it's really at the detriment of the next turn to follow. Awkward position. And if they were to hit a bump in that spot there, they'd be in big trouble. But this is something that happens with our intermediates. And hopefully we can see the similarities between those two riders. I get a lot of questions about people that are like, oh, I, I need to train for my, my level four. I need to train for my level three. I only teach beginners and it's like the same movement patterns are there, the same movement patterns. And if you can identify those same movement patterns, and if we start to draw our attention to a random on the slope, just towards the uh, right side of the screen, we can see he's in some pretty awkward position. And we're actually gonna take a look and visit our member of the public. Once we've taken a look at our rider, get into that front foot heavy, body twisted, awkward position on their snowboard. See right there, that's the result of a mistimed movement pattern on the heel edge before. Now, if we look at this rider off to the side, you can see them doing the exact same thing. They tip, they don't get tipped into the turn until they're well below the fall line, maybe even just across the fall line at the end of the turn. And the result is it takes them so much effort to get across onto their toe edge turn that follows. They end up in a very awkward and super twisted position. And if that poor rider were to hit a bump or a lump uh, in, in the similar terrain that the level four was riding, we can just imagine that they would just be all over the place and they would just get absolutely worked. So really looking at your riders and really thinking about as people start to progress in their riding, when we're beginners, we learn to change edges in the fall line and that's gonna involve some tipping across. But as we become better riders, our movement patterns that we make, that we learn to do towards the end of the turn, start to move upwards in our turn. So if we're moving our, if we're moving our inclination upwards in the turn, this ride, both of these riders could really benefit from the idea that they're doing, they're gonna move towards more inclination, moving the mass inside the turn, inclination above the fall line and angulation or bending to create uh, their edge angle as required towards the end of the turn. Uh, there, I just saw a question pop up on the screen and is the timing of the movements really important in terrain? And this is one of those movement patterns that is um, rather independent of terrain. This is something that we always wanna have happen. We wanna do inclination at the start of the turn or above the fall line and angulation towards the end. Except in the situations where we're talking about beginner turns, where they don't really change edges until they're actually in the fall line. But it's something that we wanna try and encourage our riders as they move from um, intermediates or move from beginning turns towards novice and intermediate, this is something that's gonna move upwards in the arc. 
So incline first and then angulate after. If we look at the next slide, we're gonna see another level four candidate. Is there another slide here? Oops. This one, we're gonna see another level four candidate riding some exceptionally challenging terrain, once again, at Sun Peaks. Um, and we're looking for those similar movement patterns. They get themselves into a rough position and it doesn't work out super well for them. So again, they're, we can see them really starting to lean back. Look how open the ankles are and how much the mass is uphill. And it forces them to get into a really awkward position to try to get onto the toe edge. Almost the same position, heavy on the front foot, twisted, that this rider got themselves into. They end up shoulders back, inclined heavily. They have to move pretty hard. They end up on that front foot. But they're okay because they're, that rider was on gentle terrain. This rider's on really challenging terrain. But there's those shoulders that are back. There's the inclination uphill. There's an awkward move to get into a toe edge turn. And there's an unfortunate consequence where the rider has a bad time doing, uh, doing a toe edge turn. Mm, this really something that I see is a strong similarity between when we're riding and when we're teaching um, low intermediate riders or members of the public, looking out for a movement pattern that's really similar that you're gonna see these similarities between the people that we teach every day and then the people that are coming on exams and that, that maybe you guys are trying to experience if you're looking at riding of your own riding, try to relate it back to what you're seeing. Try to relate those similarities because these movement patterns are conserved across all of Cassie. No matter what, we've got to edge and we've got to do it at the right timing of inclination and angulation. So if we go back to the first slide, Jen, of um, the level four evaluator riding that um, lovely terrain, and we look at the standard again, let's look at this a little bit more closely. And what you'll notice is that this rider really moves their shoulder across the snowboard early. They get lots of early inclination and then angulation below the fall line, allowing them to get into a really strong position by the end of their heel edge turn. And then maintaining a strong position, so easy, so smooth, and able to not just survive, but thrive through the bumps on the toe edge turn that follows. Strong position to strong position, it's an easy recovery. And then you can do some pretty cool things. Leaning across the snowboard and then pulling it back. Oh, look, strong position in the air. Now we can be confident. Watch for the shoulder leaning inwards. If we look at this video one more time on a loop, we're gonna look at the shoulder moving into an inclined position above the fall line and then that angulated position below. And that should sort of tie things together, show you got what the ideal picture is once again, now that we've had the comparison ideal and the actual, and the actual one we're looking at it in a different context on green terrain with intermediate riders. And then once again, revisiting ideal so we can hopefully get that learning process to happen. Jen, you wanna loop that one more time so we can take a look? Yes. Thanks. Oh, sorry. If you have any questions, type a man. I'll watch for those. One of your other core competencies that I was using as a filter or advanced competencies was the amount of flow from one turn into the next snow spray that goes to the sides rather than towards the end, indicating that there's loading higher in the arc, which is the hallmark of a strong rider loading and deflection happens higher in the turn. I'm not saying names. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much. Um, I don't see any more questions popping up, but hopefully this little look at one particular movement pattern that we can see in our riders that I wanted to draw out for you guys and create that similarity between high-end riding and the ideal and what we teach every day so that when you're out there um, working with uh, with intermediates, low intermediates, members of the public, you are still practicing your a &I skills at the highest level. Hope that's going to help you out as we get ready for this season and thanks so much for listening to me for the last couple of minutes. Thanks a lot, Milan. Thanks, Jen. With uh, your video done, if you want to give us a little bit of a context and then same thing, just let me know when you want me to play the video. Yeah, for sure. So um, just so everyone knows, I've got, uh, I think, four clips to look at. They're going to play in a loop and they progressively get slower as they go. Um, I've edited them in such a way that there's about 30 seconds uh, well, that I'm going to leave open for you guys to just watch the clip and kind of think for yourselves. Um, whether it's using the competencies like Breen and Mellon have been uh, talking about, or whether it's uh, kind of just adapting your, no your analysis skills in a normal way, just try to think about the outcome that you're kind of looking for or you anticipate seeing, and you're gonna see the video maybe two or three times at least. Uh, and then once we get to kind of past the 30 second mark, then I'll kick in and I'll kind of talk through as it goes frame by frame from there. Um, I'll just start by saying that I've picked a specific camera angle for each of these to kind of highlight something that the person in question was working on. So maybe that can help kind of lead your analysis a little bit. So Jen, when you're ready, you can play that video. So it's a little tough to see. This, uh, this guy does come up a little bit short on the landing. You can see the spray of snow as he uh, lands. And there's a couple other things going on that aren't quite ideal. So the first thing you'll notice uh, as he's coming in here, watch the way that he's getting from arc to arc, that he's changing edges, kind of like Mellon was saying. Is he leaning or is he angulating to get from edge to edge? What I notice is that his upper body is staying very still and his legs are moving underneath him. And watch how that gets blown out of proportion at the end here. There's a huge transition into a big slidey turn. And then another big transition into a big slidey turn on the way up the jump. So there's very little edge grip as he takes off and he ends up nearly 90 degrees at takeoff, uh, which makes it very unstable in the air. And you can see the arms and the upper body are going all over the place. And he's lost a whole bunch of speed by the time he actually hits the ground. So the setup turns are often underrated. People often kind of overlook them and uh, don't give them enough credit. What you do on the way to the jump is going to influence what you do once you're on the jump. Uh, it's it's a rhythm thing. It's a you know it it uh, it's like a habit forming thing in your brain. So what feedback I would give him is to do way less turns, if any, maybe just don't do any turns on the way down to the transition, and then try to set that uh, hourglass up with a more um, kind of slower and uh, more gradual, more efficient transition. Uh, Jen, can you maybe replay this video from the beginning now? Of course. Thank you. So I would I would cut down those turns at the beginning on the way down the slope to, to one at most, and then Try to make it so that you remain stacked over the edge um, vertically as you go through the transition and up the lip. And that'll avoid uh, ending up in that kind of slidey takeoff position. Um, 
other than that, you know, he's generating pretty decent rotation and stuff. Despite all of this, he's getting the 360 around. This is a roughly medium jump in Australia. Um, so there's not a lot that needs to be done here other than fixing his balance over the working edge. And to help that, uh, working on how he gets from arc to arc, uh, you know, some edging skills and some timing and coordination. We can go to the next one, Jen. Oops. Uh, this is a bit of an angle that you won't see very much, uh, but That's it does kind of sort of the fix that we're looking for here a little bit. So did you watch the, did you, you see can the on the way up the transition here. Yeah, this is with a drone. Pretty cool. How long and how straight that approach is and how much this rider is over top of their edge vertically. You can actually see it because we're right on top, right? So that this takeoff, this might be the same jump or a very, very similar jump. It's it's in the exact same park as the first one. Um, uh, yeah, so I think this last loop through will be very slow, if I'm not mistaken. Is it still playing? Yeah, it's still playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Uh, Sorry, no, I think I restarted. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So just watch as the rider comes up the takeoff here. Um, you'll see how uh, straight and long the turn is, how the board is directly underneath, and it's not really sliding. And there's a bit of scrub at takeoff. That's it's gonna happen, especially on a front side spin off the heel edge. It's, it, it's inevitable, You're, you can't fight that forever, but holding the board almost parallel all the way to the lip until the nose reaches the lip anyways. Um, and then you can see that they maintain balance through the air. So that's kind of the fix, the ideal that we're looking for here. This is frame by frame. You can see it all happening, right? This rider is also doing well because they're not um, moving too early into the spin. That's where the little bit of scrub comes from because they start moving into the spin right about here. You can see the arms. So they start moving into the spin just a hair early. Creates a little bit of scrubbing. Um, but nothing they can't handle. And they managed to get the 360 just about all the way around. Uh, you'll see when they land, they're maybe 20, 30 degrees off of where they want to be. But they were able to take off so balanced that they're able to then tweak the grab and you know do something more with it because they have that much stability at takeoff. Um, so then we'll just watch this land, rider land and then we can go to the next one. So hopefully that kind of illustrates what we're looking for in terms of the setup turns. Long, straight, stack. You can also see that this rider lands well past the landing or well past the knuckle in the sweet spot. They didn't lose any speed on takeoff from that scrubbing. Perfect. We can go to the next one. Next one. Any questions? You write them on the chat. Someone? Yeah, did. maybe I'll just handle questions at the end. Someone uh, did some drawing on the slide. <laughs> Uh, Jen, can you skip to the next video and we'll come back the to this one? Okay, no problem. Go. So this rider here, I'll give you 30 seconds to just watch this guy. These guys are doing 180. This is the next two. This is on a small jump in Whistler a few years ago. So this rider starts very tall, stacked. He's doing a good job of what we spoke about before, but watch his movements in terms of the pressure that he's facing in the jump. So he's very tall here. Where does he start to move down in order to get ready to move back up? 
He's moving down. So now he's moving down. And he's getting smaller going up the face of the jump, which is the exact opposite of what we'd like to do. This is a super common problem, which is why I've taken this camera angle. Um, because we're condensing, we're compressing into the face of the jump as that pressure from the uphill is, is pushing against us. And that means that our body is actually not going up off the jump. Our body is actually going down. If you watch the trajectory of his center of mass, it's kind of going through the lip. It's going much flatter than the angle of the takeoff, which actually results in the board getting pushed up off the takeoff and him ending up on a bit of an awkward angle in the air putting him off balance once he lands. He kind of manages to get all the way through the spin uh, and catch it on his toe edge, but you can see that he's not balanced in the air and he's not balanced when he's landing, so he's not able to kind of hang onto it. You can see the arms kind of swing round and through, so he's he might ride away from this one, but it's not going to be super clean and he's not kind of landing bolts, as we say. Jen, can you just loop that back to the, the beginning again? So especially in faster motion, you might be able to see this. Depends on how chunky the video is. But watch the trajectory of his upper body. See how he squashes the air time he should be getting. This is a timing coordination thing with pressure again, kind of not pushing back against the forces that of the jump, not pushing back early enough anyways. There is a little extension towards the end, but it's kind of too late or too little, too late. Um, some other things, there's a little bit of leaning with the rotation and stuff. Uh, but the main thing here is just the timing of the pop. And whether or not he was doing a 180, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, this is one of the, honestly, this is like 90% of the trouble people have on the park one is this exact thing here is getting the timing of pop right. A lot of people wait too late. They start too tall, wait until they feel the pressure of the jump, compress, and then try to kind of blah after that. We need to come in already ready to face that pressure from the jump. I'll just kind of let this play out until he gets off the lip, just so everyone can take another look. The leaning here does create a little bit of scrub. You can see he's kind of not holding that edge super well but that's also because the he's not dealing with the pressures super well it's hard to edge well when the pressures are kind of all over the place perfect jen can we go back to the previous video yes so this next video here this guy uh he's a really good park rider i think he just happened to be doing his park one for points or whatever so he's giving us a really good example of what we'd like to see so just take a 30 seconds to look at this one and spot the differences. So you can see he's already low in the transition of the jump. He's not waiting for the forces. He's ready to move up. You can see that from the transition, he's going to start moving up slowly and steadily. And especially where the jump gives him the most force is where he's going to put the most force in. He's going to match the pressure he's feeling from the jump. You see that he doesn't push himself quite all the way to full extension. He's going to keep a little bit of bend in his knees. And he's going to kind of get his body roughly parallel with the takeoff to snap that spin um, at the lip. As far as spins go, that's what you're looking to do. You want to be about 90 degrees right at the lip. And you want to try and make that happen as quick as possible at the lip. You don't want to kind of do it spread out over the whole course of the jump if you can. And you can see that he's super balanced. His body goes up off the takeoff, matches the, the angle of the, the takeoff, and he actually pulls his legs up. We'll talk about that in a second. 
he gets a little bit extra out of his board. His board goes up more than the angle of the takeoff. And that's something I call snap. It's it's kind of like an ollie, and we'll see that in a second. Jen, can you wind it back to kind of when it's doing the slow-mo bit? Yeah. Like. Yeah, just back to the beginning there. So as, as we come, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jen. So I want you guys to now watch what he's doing with his lower body and how the board leaves the snow. It's pretty subtle, but you can kind of see he's not simply pulling his legs up. It's not just yoinking your legs up once you're in the air. There is a reaction happening in the board. He's generating all this pressure by moving his body up through the takeoff against the pressure of the, of the jump. And he's concentrating it into the tail of his board. So if you watch carefully, you can see how he gently, not a lot, but a little, shifts his weight towards his back foot as he goes up the jump. And he focuses all of that force, all that pressure that he's built up into the tail of the board. And you'll see that there's a little bit of bend behind his back foot as the board is coming off the lip. And then you'll be able to see what happens to the snowboard after that. So the two leg extension through the jump sets his body in motion. And then what he does with his legs individually as a bit of an ollie move sets the board in motion. And this is what gives us a really great tucked up position that's super adaptable and super balanced in the air. So there's a moment where the board's actually slipping through the takeoff. And then that's kind of the spring action happening here. See how high the board is compared to the angle of the takeoff. Mm -hmm. So he's a small ollie, it's pretty subtle because it's just building on the forces that he already created by extending through the takeoff, just focusing that energy into the tail of the board. And that gets him into this nice tucked up position. So those are a couple concepts that are pretty common um, things we talk about in the park. This one here is, is a timing coordination uh, pressure kind of thing to do with uh, loading and deflection uh, competency uh, or kind of uh, centered and mobile. You can't really do what this guy's doing without being centered. If you're off balance, you're not going to be able to make those minute fine adjustments to focus that pressure in the right spot. And then the first couple of videos were showing us a little bit more about arc to arc um, and uh, balanced along the working edge, some very kind of fundamental stuff. They're not necessarily just doing straight airs here, but it, it all applies to straight airs, 360s, 720s, yeah, getting on and off rails. It's all kind of the same uh, application here. And these are some pretty common kind of problems and then solves for those problems. Sweet. Uh, I don't know. I haven't checked the chat. Let me just quickly check the chat to see if there's any questions. No, there's there's none. No. Not for now, then. Um, oh, there's when, one. when shall we initiate the rotation to have a clean takeoff? Uh, so it, it's kind of, it's relative to the jump and there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. But if you watch some slow-mo videos of pros doing spins, um, if you get the right angles and stuff, sometimes they have these videos where, where you can see it happening you'll see that they maintain a pretty neutral position most of the way up the jump. And it's only the last 10 to 15% of the jump where you're gonna see the pros actually moving into their spin. And most of it happens as close as possible to the lip because you're trying to maintain balance, you're trying to build pressure, you're trying to um, set the air time over the length of the jump. And then the, the rotation is really set only in the last little bit. The smallest bit that you can dedicate to the rotation, the better, because you're going to maintain your balance better um, by doing that. So trying to set the spin as close to the lip as possible. I think that's about it. All right. Do you want me to move to another slide or? Uh, I think that's all I added. Uh -huh. Any tips? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was. <laughs> to jump at the lip. Uh, so, Harry, the, the 
just so I'll, I'll repeat the question so everyone's ears are uh, dumb. So any tips on helping to find the perfect timing to jump at the lip? Um, it's partially a matter of feel because every dump, jump is different. They all have a different shape, which means that they're going to be giving you a different amount of uh, pressure from the jump itself. So a jump that's more lippy, that's more curved, is going to kind of ramp up the pressure on you faster versus a jump that's more flat is going to have a slower kind of input of pressure to you. Um, so it depends on the jump. You have to kind of feel that. But your goal is to match what you're putting in to what the jump is doing. So if the jump is pushing on you this hard, you're pushing back on it the same amount. And you should be kind of feeling a tension in between. Um, there's a little bit, you, you're trying to kind of extend off of that. So you're trying to kind of be a little bit on top of what the jump is doing, but not that much. You're not trying to outdo it by a, a long shot. You're just trying to match it and just put a little tiny bit more in. Um, yeah, I think. And then as far as trying to time the lip, it's a matter of kind of repetition experience feeling what the lip is going to do to you and, and getting that, uh, you know, fine tuned, efficient timing down it takes a long time. So start small and, and build your way up. We have another question, Dom. Uh, do we always have to pop? No, you don't. Uh, we have in the Cassie manual, we've got coast, uh, pop and Ollie. Uh, so coasting is a totally valid way of doing things in the park. It doesn't give you a lot of options because the snowboard and the center of mass are going to stay the same kind of height uh, away from each other the whole way through the air. So it doesn't give you a lot of options in terms of what you can do once you're in the air. Um, I would say you're going to be limited to like 180s, maybe 360s on big jumps, but that would be really sketchy to try and just coast. Coasting is kind of a weird one, but it's a really good skill to get a feel for the pressure that the jump is giving you. So coasting through a jump properly without absorbing at all is a good way to do things sometimes. But uh, yeah, popping or extending through the takeoff is something you're going to want to kind of build on. And, and once you start doing it, it's actually really hard to kind of go back to coasting and not coast things. And then once you do like that last guy was doing where he's what I call snapping or, or ollieing off the kind of at the lip. Uh, once you get to that level, it's really hard to then again, go back to not doing that. It, it becomes kind of entrained in your movement patterns and it comes, becomes second nature. It's a reaction to the forces you're feeling while you're on the jump. Uh, so yeah, uh, you don't always have to pop. There are other options, but you just get more and more, options in the air uh, if you pop or ollie slash snap at the takeoff. How not to land or on the tail of the board? Uh, that's a much longer topic. Uh, I think we want to get back to Breen here for a little bit. So I'm going to leave that one with you, Anton. I want you to try and think about what causes someone to land. Let's say they're doing a straight air what causes someone to land tail heavy versus landing bolts? So flat to the takeoff or flat to the landing, sorry. What gives us that kind of up and over? What's doing that? You can watch a few videos of pros doing it. You can watch some videos of yourself or your friends doing it, or hopefully soon in a, a couple of months, you'll be able to go into the park and uh, try it out yourself and, and watch other people in real life do it. And, uh, I'll tell you one thing, it does have to do with getting the pop right. Thanks, Dom. Very good. Thank you. Hey, right, Breen, you here? Hey, guys. Sorry about that. Hey, no problem. That happens. That's technology. We deal with it. Uh, <laughs> can so you hear me now, Jen? I can hear you well now, but uh, just so everyone knows, the plan is Thanks. we're going to give it another try with Breen. And if it doesn't work, we'll record it later. M and I, and then we'll post it on our YouTube channel. So Breen, do you want me to start again with the, the video we were doing? Yeah, I'll just finish my thoughts on the first guy quickly and then we'll move on. Okay, perfect. 
All right, so sorry about that, guys, but I was talking about basically, first of all, we have to set like a goal for the, the turn shape and the speed. That's going to help us with our analysis. Then we're just going to use those competencies and go through them one by one and try to pick out, pick out the one that's the most efficient. Um, and lucky for us, they're kind of organized in priority. So I was saying with this gentleman, Saturday Mobile, yes, but you could see that sometimes he was having trouble getting on his front foot. Um, turning with the lower body, we thought, yes, balance over the working edge was really good because he's he can kind of move in and out of very inclined and not inclined. So that's the one that I would tackle that centered and mobile, the very first one, and start to work on how he can more efficiently move out of the heel side turn, pushing off the back foot to move his weight forward onto the front foot to start off his toe side turn. So Biggest efficiency, Saturn Mobile, because of that back foot. So start to work on that one first. All right, let's go to the next video. This one. All right, so the next person, again, if you think of the, the pitch was fairly steep for this person. Um, so she's definitely a little uncomfortable, but the snow was really good. The snow was nice and slushy. So that's kind of helping her. Uh, so I'm watching her ride and I'll let you guys watch it for a second. But <clears throat> again, I just want to try to use those competencies as my checklist so I can start to figure out what improvement is going to help her the most, um, overall and get her going faster down the slope. Um, so again, I'm starting with centered and mobile. So she is fairly centered on the snowboard, um, but her mobility is very, she's not really moving up and down much. So her hips are kind of between her feet. The other thing I'm looking at with her centeredness is lateral, how she is laterally. So standing up on her snowboard, um, you can see that her shoulders are not in line with the snowboard. Her, sh her shoulders, especially on her toe side edge, they say open down the fall line. So that's kind of a, a major deficiency in that certain mobile. But I'll leave that for now. I keep going with my checklist. So I'm thinking of turning with the lower body. So again, I can start with the arms. So she's not waving her arms back and forth. So I know she must be doing something right. So I move down to her hips and kind of start to see her, her hips moving a little bit. Uh, but I can tell that her, her knees aren't really following her hips. So there's not a lot of rotation with this rider. So that's definitely something we could work on is maybe more rotation. And then the other thing is how is she turning with by leaning or bending into the, to the hill. So if you watch this rider, their hips never get very far inside the fall line. So they don't use a lot of edge. They get on their edge really late. So again, that's going to affect, affect the steering of their turn. So that's another thing I might tackle. And then balance over the working edge. Again, it's kind of similar to that. So they're not able to balance on the snowboard very well or very confidently because their hips never travel very far away from their feet. And they never get the, the board very much on edge, which means they're going to be lacking in power. So this rider have a lot to choose from. So it makes it a little bit more tricky to kind of pinpoint which one I want to tackle first. Um, I think again, with the center to mobile, that's the easiest one. So work on getting the rider to keep the shoulder closed on the toe side edge um, so that she gets a little bit more power out of that turn. And then she'll be able to start her heel side turn much more efficiently. All right, let's move on to the next one. Well, you guys get a second to watch it and start to make your own opinions here. So with this gentleman, he, you can tell he's still working on turning with the lower body. He's got his hands on his hips there and he's kind of doing a tactic as he's riding down. A Saturday mobile he is, he's fairly centered on the snowboard, um, but his mobility is definitely lacking. He's very stiff and you can tell he's probably pretty nervous and maybe a little scared. So he's not moving up and down much on the snowboard. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's definitely something I could tackle is just bringing the student into some easier terrain and getting them jumping around on the snowboarding, doing some hops, hockey stock hops, or taking them in the park and taking them off small jumps um, so they can get a little bit more mobility in their riding. Turning with the lower body. So again, I can start to look at the shoulders. And with this rider, you can tell that there is quite, quite a bit of counter rotation, especially when he moves onto his toe side edge. So that's one reason he has his hands on his hips, but he's really trying to start the turn by moving weight inside the arc with his shoulder. So you can see the shoulder start to spin and he's fighting that, but you can tell he's doing it. So that's uh, a big one that I would want to tackle is just getting the student to practice leading the turn with the hip instead of the shoulder. If I move to uh, balance over the working edge, he doesn't have a lot of balance at all. You can tell he's very nervous when he's on his edge. And he, again, same with the other rider, there's not much movement inside the turn. So the board never really gets very high up on edge. And because of that, the turn is lacking power. So if we're thinking board performance, this person would never really be able to get much board performance because the board is never really put on edge. So they can't really bend it and get the spring out of it. Um, so yeah, this person, again, I would take them out of this environment, bring them to an easier run to work on their mobility through jumping and hopping. Um, and then try to maybe start doing some rollerblade turns, try to get them to use their ankles and think about starting the turn by kind of flexing their ankles up and down instead of just kind of leaning with that shoulder. I think there's one more video, Jen. Yes, and you got a question for this one I did another time to answer. When you talk of the hips, it should go up and down or back and forth. So we're talking mobility with the hips. There isn't a lot of mobility. There isn't a lot of up and down and there's not a lot of rotational movements and there's not really any fore and aft. So the rider is very static. They're not able to separate their feet movement yet. So the hips kind of generate and the, the shoulder really starts the turn and then the body kind of just stays static. Um, so if I was gonna do some take this person to some easier terrain yeah get them jumping up and down to get that vertical movement of the hips um and as, as well as you know working on going back to kind of that quick ride phase where we have our hands on our hips and we're dancing through the turns like trying to focus on moving the hip to start or even like headlights on the knees that would be something that would help this person so yeah hips aren't moving really at all and we want to get them to to start to move them Okay, you ready for the next video, Breen? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we know that we want to set the turn shape and the speed, and then we know that we want to go through the competencies one by one to kind of create a, a checklist. So then we can start to prioritize which deficiency we want to work on. And then after we've done that, we need to come up with kind of an improvement strategy. Um, so again, this is really steep terrain. It's great to do analysis on steep terrain, especially when that when you have a really nice snow like hero snow because it makes it much easier to see the deficiencies in the riding. So on a day like spring day, like today or this day, I wouldn't want to take them to a mellow blue because they're going to be riding very well. And it's going to make it harder for me to um, see what they're doing wrong, especially when I don't have a video camera and I have to watch the riding in the 10 seconds that I have as I pass them. So bringing them somewhere steep is going to help. And then when we go to work on the improvement, again, we take them out of this environment and bring them back to maybe a dark green or a, a light blue terrain to work on some drills and tactics. So now you've got a chance to watch this person ride. Um, <clears throat> centered and mobile. The hips are fairly centered, but this person, um, again, they have that kind of open shoulder. So their lateral position is a little bit off. Um, they are able to move. They move their hips kind of up and down when they need to through the turn. They're, 
<clears throat> they're able to do that. They're bounced on the snowboard. Turning with the lower body. Well, again, if I look at the shoulders, they're not swinging too much. Sometimes I can see a little bit of counter rotation when they start their toe side turn, but for the most part, they're fairly quiet. Um, the toe side's more pronounced with that counter rotation. Um, and the other thing that's holding them back is, I guess if we go back to center and mobile, they often they're they're on they're heavy on the back foot. So if we go back to turning with the lower body, it makes it really hard to initiate that turn if our weight is on the back foot. So that's something that they're struggling with, especially that toe side initiation, because uh, they're too far back. And then the balance on the working edge. This person is see, looks very comfortable on the snowboard. So again, this person is able to incline quite a bit. They have quite a few bad habits, but they are able to get the board on edge fairly early in the turn. Um, and their hips move inside quite a bit, which means the board is edging high up on the edge, which means they're able to bend it much more, which is gonna give them a lot more performance in their turn shape. Um, so <clears throat> I think the most important one for this one, again, I kind of repeated this three times, but that center to mobile, if they're, they're not on the, the front foot at the start of the toe side, they're gonna have a hard time. Um, and then just bringing them, again, working on turning with the lower body, showing them how to, <clears throat> they're really good at leaning in, edging, so how to moderate that edge. When, when do we wanna to start to get onto the edge and how far in are we gonna lean depending on the snow conditions so that we can come back um, in a neutral position to start the next turn. Yeah, so this person getting them on the front foot, um, and working a little bit more with independent feet steering, twisting those knees and the feet, and trying to stop relying on the shoulder. So I guess the, the last part, the improvement plan, again, taking them out of this environment and coming up with some tactics that are gonna mimic the deficiency that you see. So, you know, if, it's, if they're not centered on the snowboard, you might be doing lots of jumps and hopping and spinning sliding through 60s and that kind of thing and some mellower train if it's the turning with the lower body then maybe you're going with some tactics like headlights on the knees um, or edging exercises trying to get the student to get the board more on edge so maybe some big uphill carve turns or something like that um, and balance over the working edge <clears throat> again has to do with that edge control so again hopping jumping, going in the park, going through the trees uh, and getting them to trust their snowboard. So if you don't trust your snowboard, you're always gonna have a hard time letting the hips incline into the hill and getting that balance. So maybe doing drills where the students are trying to incline as much as they can, almost to the point where they fall over could be a, a way to help them with that. And that's it for me. I hope that helps you guys kind of refresh your analysis skills. And when you see your students riding down the hill, kind of gives you a plan of where to start and where to finish. Thanks a lot, Bryn. No problem. Question in the chat. No. Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone attending this session. I think um, Maybe, I don't know if uh, Melan and Dom or Brian, you have any uh, other um, analysis tip you want to share quickly with the crew before we, uh, we we close the session. But I think you guys, you, you looked at how um, three of, of the technical team members just went through their analysis. And especially with doing these videos, what's really it gives us a, a good opportunity to train our analysis and, and uh, our, our analysis skills, sorry, and um, to take our time. And I think that's like the biggest message to take your time to train this skill, right? And like Breen was just doing in his video, going over each competency one at the time, a little bit like if you're peeling an onion, you're going with the centered and mobile in detail. So you look at that person, and you look at that person again with a different filter every time to give you like the whole filter picture idea. Um, this is something that sometimes at first it can take a little bit more time, as you may know. But then um, when you get really good at it, it's it's very quick. It's only going to take you a few turns to analyze the first 
peel of the first onion sheet and then the second onion sheet. So I'd like to refer to the, that onion analogy and my friend Chewy out there would, would like me to refer to it because he, he loved this analogy as well. Chewy, if you're here, hello. And uh, yeah, so just take your time, train this skill. Um, also know what you're looking for when you're analyzing, make a plan, use these competencies, use these writing skills that, uh, that we provide, use all these tools and um, yeah. That, that's it. Any anyone you want to add, uh, Don, Melon, and anything you want to add, Don, Melon, and Bree? No, thank you very much, everyone, for showing up and for checking this out. Thank you to everyone who views this later on YouTube, even if you watched it uh, through already. So, um, thanks, crew. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Slow. Thanks for everyone's patience. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Awesome.